<clears throat> Greetings. The Lord is with you. Uh, tonight, um, we are, uh, well, I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance at Good Hope Lutheran Church, and I'm pleased to be with you. Uh, it's Friday evening, uh, July 8th, and we are reading one chapter of the New Testament five days a week, and we are in the Gospel of Luke, and we are in chapter 8 today. Um, after the birth narrative, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, is the first uh, or second section of Luke's Gospel. And it ends in near the end of chapter 9, so on Monday we'll be looking at that. And then we go in the journey toward Jerusalem that begins at the end of chapter 9. Today we're in chapter 8, and I had preached on chapter 8 just a few weeks ago, really the, uh, the last two-thirds of the chapter, uh, because we had one of the four stories that comprised the last two-thirds of the chapter. So I'll mention them again, but I preached on a Sunday just about, about that just a few weeks ago. So uh, we'll focus in on the beginning stories, and then we'll look at the, um, um, at, at the other three, four stories. Well, let's uh, begin as together. I see Debbie's on. Good evening, Debbie, and God bless you. And, uh, and, and welcome to everyone who's on. And we begin as we together make the sign of the cross and say together, we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, uh, and an opening prayer. Lord, thank you for your word today. Your word of life. How you invite us to be deeply connected to you. Lord, I, I pray that in this opening parable uh, that, that you speak to us, um, that we might not be people who hear the word and then it just gets snatched away or is shallow or choked out. But Lord, let your word take root in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 8 begins, um, uh, it, we had in chapter 6 a naming of uh, many disciples, but 12 were named or called apostles. Today, we hear about other uh, followers. Soon afterward, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12, the 12 chosen to be apostles, were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Many people who were touched by Jesus continued to follow him. Good evening, uh, Mark. And so the 12 were with him. I'm sure others were, but the 12 apostles and women are named. And they're specifically named. Uh, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. So these are women who are women of means. Uh, certainly Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, uh, a prestigious uh, position, probably exceedingly well paid. And uh, his wife, uh, Joanna, was a follower of Jesus. And she used the resources in her hands uh, to help fund Jesus's ministry, as well as did Mary and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Jesus had given to them and they want others to, to know the, the blessings that Jesus has given them. And so they helped to fund the ministry to make that happen. In that why we give to church um, to help others have the blessings that uh, to pass on to others the blessings that have been given to us well now comes the great parable of the sower when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to hear him he said in a parable a sower went out to sow his seed and he's obviously broadcasting it by hand um, as you would, not a row crop, but a crop like wheat 
or barley. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he threw and cast the seed, some fell on the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and it grew up. It withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, so the parable's for everyone, but he knows not everyone has an ear to hear. I think that's because some things are spiritually understood, and they have, they've not been renewed, reborn. It's going to be hard to understand. So the goal is for us, of course, not to have people understand every story in the Bible, but to pray for them and help them come to faith in Christ, that their spirit might re be reborn, and, and then they can understand the scriptures. How many times the disciples were confused until on the night of the resurrection, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Well, that's the parable. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what the parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables. So that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Again, it's spiritually perceived. Um, he's not going to be able to touch the minds of everyone and save them. It's their spirit and heart. And when they trust him, then, then they begin to understand. It's like that old phrase, uh, seeing is believing. Well, I need some proof. I need to understand it. I need to see it. But the opposite phrase is true, even more true, spiritually. Believing is seeing. Believing opens our eyes to seeing in a new way. So Jesus is going after hearts, not minds. Uh, I, I think uh, in our time in conversations with people, we get that mixed up so much. We're trying to convince them of the rightness of our argument, of our thinking, when really it's all about their heart and, and having a relationship where new insights can be born. So he begins to explain the parable to them. Now the parable is this, uh, and it's like an allegory, everything representing something else. The seed is the word of God. Of course, then Jesus is the one casting the word. But today, Christians might do so. The seed is the word of God. The ones, the seed that fell on the path are those who have heard, here, the seed are people. Um, or the people, the path of the four soils are like people. And the seed falls on some people who are like hard path. Um, where the seed gets trampled underfoot and the birds take it away. Here he explains that. The ones on the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. It's like in one ear out the other. It, or it bounced off them. Or flew over their head. It just, they, never, they never comprehended. Never came to faith. Sometimes the word of God that Jesus preaches does not take root in people's lives. It just bounces off. People from whom it bounces off are, are like the soil that is the hard path. Verse 13. And the ones on the rocks are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. People come to faith. But the goal for us is not to get people to join the church, but to grow deeper in their faith. All of us, always to growing deeper. So that in times of testing, we may not fall away. Think of Paul, all the, 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 the book of Acts and the letters of Paul that we've been going through, and the terrible adversity he faced. But he grew stronger in suffering. Um, and, and, and so it can do that for us. But for those 
who haven't grown deep in the word. And Paul grew deep in those three years before he started ministry, where he spent time in Arabia, um, reconsidering everything in the Old Testament and, and pouring over the scriptures and being understanding who the Messiah is. His mind was open to understand the scriptures. And after that, he was ready uh, to go and be used by God and, and to face terrible persecution. Well, those uh, the seed, when it falls on, on people who are only like rocky, shallow Christians, haven't grown deeper in their faith. Uh, they're like those who receive the word gladly, but in time of testing, it falls away. Third soil. And as for the seed that fell on the thorns, people who are like the thorny ground, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, so they hear, they believe, they respond. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. They're a plant. Uh, they're a Christian, but they're not bearing any fruit. And that word choked is such an awful phrase. Um, thinking of a person choking on food, or I think of my grandmother who had emphysema, or some of our members who have COPD, and how hard it is to breathe until they get their breathing treatments and, and medications. My grandmother was that way. She had to get her breathing treatments twice a day um, so that she could breathe. And finally, she got to a university hospital up in the Toledo area, and they found some real help for her. Um, that sense of choking, um, that just not being able to breathe, uh, an awful feeling. Well, these people have this awful experience because they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Sometimes what happens is the cares, the worries, the concerns, the business of life, um, taking the kids to school and soccer, um, uh, or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, um, uh, going to work, um, mowing the lawn, uh, everything that has to do, the cares of life, illnesses, financial worries, they can choke the, the spiritual life out of a person. Or riches, where I have everything I need. And having everything I need, I need, I don't need, I think that I don't need God. And that chokes the life of a Christian and the pleasures of life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Um, one can be so invested in the pleasures of life uh, that it chokes the spiritual life. And so a person remains a Christian. Uh, they're a plant. But no head grows in the grain. They are just green leaves, but no fruit. So those are the first three soils, the path, the rocky ground where it's shallow, and the thorny ground that comes and chokes up the, the life, the spiritual life of the word. And finally, as for that which is in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. It takes time. But as they hold on to the word, and if they fall away, they just get back up and they hold on to the word again. It will bear fruit if they are patient. So just come back. You've fallen. You failed. Don't worry. Just come back. Don't let it choke the spiritual life out of you. Just come back and hold on to the faith. Hold on to the word. Um, and hold it fast. And it will bear fruit if you are patient. Well, I think this is a wonderful parable uh, that that we can relate to, we who are Christians. Because there are, uh, w one can ask about our lives. Where in my life, if I'm like, if uh, where are where in my life am I rocky? Where where am I shallow in my faith? There's probably shallow areas in everyone's personal life, areas that we haven't really fully turned over to God, or there's thorns uh, in our growing in our our life uh, cares or riches or pleasures 
that have gotten in the way of my relationship with God. They will get in the way of being a mature Christian, able to withstand the storms of life. That's the first parable. He talks about the women, now this parable. And then Jesus says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Jesus is spreading light. He's not trying to hide anything. Um, uh, nothing is hidden that is not to be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be made known. He's got no secret messages um, that only the few elite will get to know. No, there's no secrets in the Christian life. Jesus just puts it right out there plainly for everybody. For some, it just passes right over them or it bounces off like the hard soil. But he intends his word for those who are who are reborn, and there's no other way to enter understanding the word than to give your life to Jesus Christ, to invite him to come into your life and ask him to forgive you and to, to renew you and to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And when we do that, there'll be some rocks, there'll be some thorns, but there will be good soil if, if, if in our lives if we hold fast to the word because he's setting this word on a lampstand. He's not hiding anything. No secret knowledge. His mother and brothers come to him. So we have the women, the parable, this lamp, and the, and the, and the mother and brothers coming. And then there's going to be four stories at the end, the second two-thirds of the, of the chapter. And I'm just briefly going to touch those. His mother and brothers come to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And so the crowd told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. And he answered them. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Wow. You are my family. If you, like in the parable of the good soil, hear the word, hold fast to the word, and grow and mature and bear fruit a hundredfold. I don't think that's so much an off-putting of his mother and brothers as it is including the rest of us. Like... It's not again. We we've heard this throughout this gospel so far. There's no special privileges owed anyone. Um, not even his mother and brothers get special privileges. But we get the special privilege of being invited to be part of Jesus's family. He's the Son of God, and we become children of God, brothers of Christ. He is our Lord. We are His family when we come to faith. Isn't that an amazing gift? Then the last four stories that are set in two couplets. So I just go through those briefly. But all th these four stories in the, in the second half of chapter 8 are about the power and the authority of Jesus. Remember the centurion that we saw uh, yesterday in, in chapter 7. Um, uh, he hadn't seen any, Jesus had not seen such great faith even in all the land of Israel. The centurion said, you can just say the word. You don't need to come to my house. Say the word, and my servant will be healed, because I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another come, and he comes, and my servant do this, and he does it. I expect, Lord, when you speak, what you say will be done. You don't need to come to my house. I'm not worthy. Remember that? Uh, we, we talked about that worthiness thing. No, he, he knew humble that he was not worthy. And uh, Jesus said he hadn't seen great, such great faith. Well, that theme was introduced in chapter 7. Here in chapter 8, it is full in our face, the authority, the power, and the authority of Jesus. Um, and the four stories are over nature, the stilling of the storm, over demons, over that demon-possessed man with a legion of demons, over illness, the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years, and over death, Jairus' little girl. Um, and, and these are shared in two couplets. The, the two stories are related. The four stories are related, two stories and two stories. The first story, he, it begins in verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. Then, of course, we know the storm rises. The disciples are afraid that they're going to perish. They wake Jesus and he, he, he rebukes like a, a demon. He rebukes the wind and, and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. 
And the disciple, he asked them, where's your faith? Where's your trust in me? Um, he's leading them to the other side. If he's leading them to the other side, they don't need to worry. Now, they could drown, but it'd be his will. <laughs> where's your faith? Trust me. And they're seeing the, that, that nature obeyed his command. They asked, who is this? that even the winds and the water obey him. That story is related to the next story because he said to them, let's go across to the other side. He gets to the other side, meets the demon-possessed man, catches the demons out, and then the crowd, the, the townspeople, the country people come, they, they hear the story of what he did to this, this man who, who they, they had tried to put in chains and in prison, and he always broke every prison, escaped, uh, escaped every prison, broke every chain. A wild man full of these demons, and, and they they found him sitting in his right mind next to Jesus, fully clothed, and it caused great fear in them. That was their response, and they asked Jesus to leave. And so then we hear at the end of the story, so he verse uh, the end of verse thirty seven. They were seized with great fear, so he got in the boat and returned, which tells me the two stories were were related. Uh, they, Jesus wanted to go to the other side. He had an appointment with a man possessed of a legion of demons. That man didn't know he was coming. The disciples didn't know why Jesus was going, but he was going for that one person. Isn't that an amazing story? In the midst of the storms of life, Jesus has authority over nature. He has authority over demons, and he will go out of his way to visit one person. Good evening, Cheryl. Good to see you. Um, what a great story of Jesus. So he'll come for you, wherever you are. Um, he got in the boat and he returned back to his place. But before he got in the boat, the man who had been set free begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This was the story I had several weeks ago. And I said, you can't just look at this story by itself. You really need all four stories. The power and the authority of Jesus over nature, over demons, and now over illness and death. He comes back to the, the um, side of Israel. And where the people, the Gerizans, had been afraid of him and asked him to leave, we're told in verse 40, the crowd, when he returned, the crowd welcomed him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Which sounds just like the centurion, with that servant whom he loved. This is a man with his daughter. And he comes and falls at Jesus' feet and implored him to come to the house. Jesus went. But on the way... There's a woman who comes up behind him uh, who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. Everyone practiced the arts the best they could back then and they she just spent all her money. But she believed in Jesus and so she thought to herself, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment and immediately her discharge of blood ceased because she thought, if I just touch the fringe of his robe, I'll be made well. And the wonderful story here is that Jesus said, who touched me? Peter said, uh, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in at you. In other words, everybody's touching you. Oh no, Jesus said. Someone touched me for I perceived the power had gone out from me. Well, there's a story right there. Um, you can touch Jesus, you can be around Jesus, but it won't make any difference until you touch him by faith. Uh, and Jesus perceives when someone is reaching out to him in faith. He felt the power flow from him into this woman because faith was present in this woman. I don't know what was present in all the rest of the crowd, but this woman in her desperation believed if she just touched the fringe of his garment, she would be healed, and she was. Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. She knew she had been caught and came up and told him everything. 
And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Shalom. At that very moment, someone comes from the uh, Jairus' the, the synagogue official's home, or the ruler's home, and says, your daughter is dead. Too late. Don't bother the teacher anymore. But Jesus heard that and said, oh no. Do not fear, only believe. What the disciples didn't do in the boat, what the woman did, Jesus, Jesus said, only believe and she will be well. And he went to the house. He took, uh, he left everybody behind, took Peter, James, John, and the mother and father and went into the girl. He, he, everybody was mourning and weeping. And, and he said, don't weep. She's not dead. She's sleeping. <laughs> well, death is nothing uh, for Jesus because he has power over nature, power over demons, power over illness, and power over death, the power of life. There is no power greater than Jesus' power. Everything must submit to him. Just like the centurion believed, you say something, Lord, it will be done. But Jesus has power over everything in our life. Faith unlocks that power, connects us, I should say, to that power. Only believe and she will be well. The crowd laughed at him. But he took the parents and the three disciples with him. And he took the child by hand and said, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. She really was dead. She wasn't just sleeping. Her spirit had left her body and gone to be with the Lord. But it came back because he called her back to life child arise and her spirit returned and she got up at once her parents were amazed but he charged them to tell no one what had happened everybody knew it's called the messianic secret and i suppose that's for another day i was really wanted to spend most of my time on those first few stories uh, the parable of the seed and the sower and and uh, the women and the, the story of his mothers and brothers and that we're all invited to be his family. I hope that you are growing in your faith and you are rooted in Jesus uh, so that you might have the strength for all the storms of life that will blow, the illnesses that will come, the death that will eventually come to all of us, but that you can know the victory and power of Jesus over all those things. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this. Two chapters we've had, amazing chapters. And before that, we had the Sermon on the Plain. Thank you for the book of Luke. And thank you for today's reading in chapter 8. I pray, Lord, that it might take root in our lives and that you might, we might always come back to the, the end of the, the Sermon on the Plain in chapter 6. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Lord, let us hear your word. And let us hold it fast. And when we have failed, help us repent and receive your immediate forgiveness and hold back, hold fast again to your word that we might walk on the path that gives us true life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me on this Friday, my day off. I'm out on the property, did some work, got up early at 6.15 this morning to get some things done outside. And we've been working away today. And so I was glad to, to take a break and, and visit with you this evening. And maybe now I'll take a break and spend some time with the family. Well, I've had some time with them already, but uh, we'll together uh, maybe enjoy the evening. I hope you enjoy the evening. And I'll be back with you on Monday when we go to Chapter 9 that ends this section and gets us started on that journey toward Jerusalem. On Sunday... Uh, I'll be preaching on a portion of chapter 10, and I, I preached on a portion of chapter 10 last week as well, um, last Sunday, and this Sunday it's the story of the Good Samaritan, and so I'll be speaking on that on Tuesday, but I'll have preached on that story on Sunday. I invite you to join on our church's website or YouTube channel for Sunday worship. And then the following week we have the story of Martha and Mary and a healing a service at church. 
Well, thank you for joining us. And remember always, God loves you. And so do I. Bye-bye.